Uh, so uh, if you've been paying any attention to the news and whatnot, can we agree that uh, Corona is everywhere? Like, um, uh, in fact, I'm just so proud of all of you that you decided to risk your very lives by coming to church today. Um, and, and for the record, this is nothing. This probably reveals a lot about me. But did anyone else, does anyone else remember the name of the disease by the beer? Corona? Anyway, can we be honest? Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and so, uh, but, but here's the amazing thing, uh, and, and tell me if this doesn't resonate a bit with you, it's just I'm really kind of blown away just by how fragile humanity is. Um, like how, how just for all of our, you know, pride and we figured everything out and all that, it, it just takes something so small, you can't even see it. It's, it's unseen to the eye, and it could absolutely turn the world on its head. And so, like, with, with all the news going on, like, you guys realize that nations are being rocked, that entire industries are being rocked, all because of the threat of something that we can't even see. Um, and so here's what's amazing. And so the, the media coverage... Uh, I don't know where you guys, where everyone stands. You know, I just want to respect everyone's view. For me, I'm like, this feels really over the top um, because it's like, you guys know, like, like I was talking to Chris the other day, it was like 80,000 people died from the flu, um, you know, so, and I don't know what the numbers are not to, but, but listen, don't hear me going one way or the other um, with that. My, my point is this, I feel like, like there's, there's this panic frenzy going on right now uh, because of this. But, uh, but I'm grateful that now I find myself, I'm very aware. Are you that way? Like, I, I've spent a, a little bit of time in Manhattan, and as everyone's getting their Purell out right now, I just saw that. So, uh, uh, okay, um, we can pass that around in a second, all right? Uh, but, but I spent time in Manhattan, and just with that massive humanity, I'm like, I can see how people would get kind of pretty, and, uh, and I recognize, too, there's too, a lot of times it can get on your hands, and then when you, you can't, you shouldn't touch your face. And now I'm aware of how much I touch my face all the time, all right? And so I'm, I'm grateful for the awareness. But here's the, the caveat, and this is just me speaking. I just, I refuse to live my life in fear. I just believe that there's a sovereign God over all things. And listen, when it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's kind of our big idea for today, all right? Um, I want I'm, I'm gonna I want to make you aware of some things, but I also want you to make you confident in some other things. All right, and so that's kind of where our message is going. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us just great grace uh, this morning in Jesus' name. And so, uh, so my goal is to stir awareness and confidence, not in the unseen world of germs and virus, rather the unseen world. Of the Spirit. And so uh, right now, if you've invited a guest to your first time here, like, ooh, ooh, cuckoo, okay, one of those churches, note to self, all right? And uh, if you brought a guest, I apologize, uh, but I think this is unbelievably important uh, for the life of our church. Uh, let me read a quote from, from C.S. Lewis. He says this He says, There are two equal and opposite errors or extremes into which our race can fall about the devils. He says, one is to disbelieve their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. And so did you catch that? So, uh, like, you can be just consumed, and everything's a demon, and everything's a devil, or you can just poo-poo it away that, oh, this is just kind of your weird, we're enlightened, and we're past that stuff, Pastor, right? And so there's two opposite extremes, and both of which are dangerous, because you're not aware of something, and on the other extreme, you're not confident in who you are in someone. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, uh, later. So um, I, I know we live in our Western uh, enlightened world, and so we're not going to believe in spirits and, and stuff like that. But, uh, but do you guys know that, like, you know 80% of the globe uh, believes very differently, <laughs> Like, they believe in that there's a spiritual dimension, that there's something. And so we're, we're the minority here in the West. And a lot of times we, we just think it's because we're just, we've so enlightened that we've just kind of now rationalized and reasoned everything away. And so, uh, but, but here's the reality. If there is no spiritual dimension, 
then, um, so you mean to tell me, then, then you know what? Love, there, there's no backing for love because love doesn't exist. It's just chemicals shooting off in your body. See, we know that there's something more behind just flesh and blood. Um, have you, if you've ever gone out and just experienced beauty and it moves you, like there's something deeper behind that. There's something spiritual, real. Um, the idea of good and evil. Around the globe, people would agree there's good and there's evil. But listen, if there is no spiritual world and dimension, where do you get that from? It's just the strong survive and that you're, that's, the, where do you get that? Um, here's another one, and, and I'll just tell you this. Um, if you're a Bible person, and, and you still, if you have trouble believing in a spiritual dimension, you have not read that book. It is everywhere in that book. From the beginning to the ending, there's angels, demons, archangels, principalities, powers, um, all these different things. Um, if you don't believe that there's a spiritual dimension uh, Jesus would disagree with you because when Jesus walked the earth, he had a lot to say about demons and to demons, all right? Most of the time it was get out, beat it, okay? It was, was kind of how Jesus would handle that thing. And so, uh, so I, I want to, uh, if you come in here today kind of skeptical, I want to make you aware of some stuff, but I also want to make you confident in some things. And so the Bible, if you know the story, and I'm so glad we've taken this year to kind of go through the Bible narrative, um, if you're familiar with it, it describes, the whole book is describing a spiritual battle, that there is a conflict. Uh, in fact, if you have your Bible, uh, not the real Bibles, like paper, not the fake ones on your phone, all right? If you get a Bible, there's two chapters in Genesis at the start, and two chapters in the end of Revelation where there's peace. All the rest of the book is conflict. All of it. It's all a spiritual fight, a spiritual battle. And, uh, and I hate to tell you this. You and I have been born into that spiritual battle. And here's what I want to do this morning. I want to dispel the myth that there's somehow, some way you can be neutral in this battle. Like, like somehow we can just say, I'm just not going to be for either side. Just leave me alone, and I'm just going to be on the middle. We want to be Canada, right? <laughs> just want everyone to like us. Sorry, baby, about that one. So, um, but <clears throat> there is no neutrality. There, there, it, you are born into a conflict. And let me do uh, C.S. Lewis. It'll be my last Lewis quote. I'm kind of a C.S. Lewis geek, but he says this. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And so uh, that is the bad news that we're born into a battle. We're born into a war zone. But I got good news for you. You get to choose which side. You get to choose which side you want to be on. And so before you choose, uh, I, I would like to lay out your, your two uh, choices uh, uh, juxtapose them between each other. Um, I don't know how to spell that word, but I could barely say it, but ju we're going to juxtapose it. And so uh, is this is, so Satan is, is a created, uh, he's a creature, he's a created being. Uh, Jesus is the creator, all right? Uh, let's go on. So Jesus is omnipotent. That means he has all power. Satan is unipotent. He has one move. He's a liar. He has the power to lie and deceive. Uh, he's called the father of lies. Jesus declares himself, I am the truth. Uh, let's go on. So Satan, he enslaves his subjects. And Jesus comes to set captives free. Um, we have Jesus, uh, the, the Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come and I'm bringing life and life abundant to you. And so uh, before you make your choice here this morning, all right, there's more. Um, there seems to be this false narrative that is really kind of subversively kind of entered into our consciousness uh, through media, Hollywood, these type of things. And tell me it's not real that, uh, man, Satan 
uh, demonic powers, are, they're unbelievably powerful. So you better watch out. And tell me, isn't it the truth? Every Jesus guy in the, in the movies, how many know that they, they always get worked, right? That demon-possessed girl or something's going to crawl on the ceiling and then do something, and that, that, that priest is going to get worked up. How many, that is not the Bible. That is Hollywood. If, if, the, if it was a biblically accurate movie, it would be very short. Demon out, credits roll, all right? And there we go, at the end of the movie. Um, and so um, I, I would counter, the, so, so to have an unhealthy fear and terror of, of the devil, demons, dark forces, uh, it just shows you just, right now you're just not confident who you are in Jesus. I hope to remedy that today. Um, but I would say this, uh, which, which really dysfunctional though would be is to not fear the one who created everything. And that the only reason things hold together is because of the word of his power. And so the one that we need to fear reverently awe is our God. And here's the great news. If you're in his son Jesus, he calls us his sons and his daughters. He's our dad. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, uh, verse 16. It's actually Isaiah is prophesying um, about the king of Babylon but it actually, most theologians believe he's also referencing Satan. And here's what it says. It won't be on the screen. He says this, though. It says that at the end of time, you'll see Satan, our adversary, and the nations will say, those who see you will stare and ponder your fate. They will ask, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms? Our response will be, when we see him for who he is, we'll be like, seriously? Like, that's what the prophet Isaiah, where God says through the prophet Isaiah. Um, uh, let me just as well, just keep going a little bit further, because I just want to show you when God wants to flex. Um, Jesus, when he walked the earth, there's a Gadarean demoniac. Uh, we'd find out later, he's got 5,000 demons, because the demons named, they call him legion. A Roman legion would be 5,000 so we have 5,000 demons against Jesus running towards one another. There's going to be this epic collision in battle. But how many know this battle never happens? Because that demon-possessed guy falls on his face, and the demons begin to cry out, Have you come to torment us before the time? And with a word, he casts them out uh, into a bunch of swine. Um, here's another thing. The angelic heavenly hosts that serve our great and glorious God. Do you know in 2 Kings chapter uh, 19, uh, it tells about the angel of the Lord. Uh, it, it, he entered into the camp of an Assyrian army, 185,000 trained Assyrian warriors, and one angel of the Lord wiped them all out, all right? Um, um, do you know at the end of time, it says that Jesus is going to have 100 million angels coming with him? <laughs> uh, and so here's another one, uh, James 2.19. Uh, it says this in the book of James. That's Jesus' brother when he was the earth. And James says this. He says, um, uh, do you, you believe uh, in one God? He says, the demons believe, and they shudder. Mufasa. Hmm. Right? Um, you know it's funny? I've been doing that one for about a decade, and it gets a laugh every time. Um, uh, and then lastly, I'll end with this, is like, you know the idea of Armageddon? We've, we've had movies about it, books about it, because there is something inside humanity. There's kind of this knowing that the world eventually is coming to this crossroads to the end of time, and there's this kind of faint understanding of there's going to be a, this great battle, Armageddon, call it whatever you want, but the Bible, the scriptures say this, at the end of time, it is not an epic battle. It is... Jesus Christ come in all his power, in all his glory, and it says he defeats his enemies with the, the breath of his mouth. He blows over his enemies. And so um, um, uh, I'm still not going to let you choose sides yet. All right, I got a, I got a little bit more. Um, and so, uh, so here's what I want. I, we, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, and I promise I'm going to go fast. But uh, in the book of Ephesians, um, there's a mega theme throughout the book. Um, it's this, in him, in him, 
in him. It appears 27 times in the book. It only has six chapters. And so it's this mega theme throughout the book that the Apostle Paul wants us to recognize what we have, what we possess in him. And so for our, our minds here in 2020, I'm going to uh, just uh, talk to any Marvel Avenger people. Great. Come on. I'm t- you're my people. I- I'm there with you, man. And so, uh, but I'm not going to have any nonsense. We all know Iron Man is the best, all right? But how many know Iron Man is just Tony Stark until he gets in the suit? And this is you and I. We're just you and me. But when we're in him, y'all better recognize, all right? And so uh, I want you to see some things we get in him. These will not be on the screen. I did not want to bombard you with Ephesians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Here's, a, here's what you, you got it. Like, we, are, we have all these spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. You're like, great, Pastor, I have these pretend blessings. No. There, God is, you're accruing blessings in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you realize this, but there's coming a time when heaven is going to be knit with earth, and suddenly all your heavenly investments are going to come to fruition, and you're going to receive the blessing. Uh, Let me give you another one. Uh, Ephesians 1.4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him, uh, uh, in love. And so, uh, listen, I don't know, uh, we, we have people that pray for you uh, at the start of every service. We pray for the service. Do you know that God spoke to our intercessory team this morning? And they said this, that some of you, you've been battling with, you can't shake this, this kind of sense of shame or this sin that's haunted you. Um, you you've been wearing it. And, and the, the word of the Lord for you today was this, it's because you have not encountered Jesus Christ, like a power encounter. And the word of the Lord to you is this, you are not stuck, you are not chained to that thing, but God says, I'm going to break you free. And so as you experience, as you're in him, all that garbage falls off and you're made new. Um, Let me give you another one. Uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 5 through 6 says this, it says, even when we were dead in our trap, he made us alive together uh, with Christ or in him, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly realms. Doesn't that sound amazing? And I have no idea what it means. But I prayed. I'm like, Lord, thank you that I'm seated with you in the heavenly realms. I'm sure not, I'm not exactly sure what that means yet, but it's amazing. Uh, let me give you Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. You need to know this. That's the word poema in the Greek. That's where we get the word poetry. That you're God's workmanship. Created where? In Christ. You're his work of art in Christ. Listen, there's a whole bunch more, but I'm I'm gonna keep the service moving. Um, And so now I want to give you an opportunity. Who do you want to choose? Which side will you be on? And there is no neutral. And my prayer and my appeal to you that if you've been on the fence, man, just go all in in Him today. Um, Listen, we're gonna we're gonna read. uh, We're gonna be in Ephesians chapter six. I'm going to read for you verses 10 through 20, because we're going to get one more in him. And remember, I, I wanted to make you aware of some things that are going on in like the spiritual world, but I want you to be confident in this. In him, we can do everything. And so let me read you uh, some of uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. It says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So be strong in him. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Can I just point out a couple things? Like, so for example, when I was playing in the NHL, we'd have to go to Miami to play against the Florida Panthers. Uh, the moment I got off the plane in Miami, I could feel the spiritual atmosphere. Something's different there. There's this like sensual kind of 
thing going on, and I realized in my spirit, I'm like, ooh, i got to be on guard a little bit because there's something different in the atmosphere here. Um, there's certain places you can go in our nation. You go there, and you can tell that there is something in the atmosphere that causes people, they can't get out of their racism. They're stuck. It's been systemic forever. You know, there's some places you can go where the spiritual atmosphere, greed consumes it, consumes it. People are commodities, and they can't get out of it. Why? Because there's some stuff going on in the spiritual realm. Um, let me see verse 13. We're getting back to our text. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand firm. Stand, therefore. How many know that's a lot of stands? Uh, stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayers and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am, a, I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Here's what Paul's saying. This is another one of the prison epistles. He's actually writing it. He's under house arrest in Rome, and he's chained to a Roman guard. And so now we get to see him, and he's actively looking at a Roman guard, and he's like, you know what? Being in him, kind of like this dude. Salvation, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. And so he begins to unpack it for us. And, and can I just tell you this? All Paul is saying again and again, he's giving you different, different aspects of what it means to be in Christ, to be a Christian. Um, and when we're in that army, we cannot be defeated when we're in that armor, rather. And so uh, let me just break it down for us a little bit. He says, and it's, it's kind of funny that he begins with the belt of truth. And here's what I want to tell you. See, everything hinges upon truth. Um, and that's why it's the first thing. You know, you hang your weapons on the belt of truth, that everything depends on it. Um, and so here's my question that I ask to you. Where do you go to get truth? I know some of you are, Fox News. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, CNN. No, no, again, um, is, is this. See, um, so where do you go to ask um, what's true about life? Because you go somewhere, like you have a way you think the world works. Where do you get that? Uh, let me give you another one. Is this, uh, is there right and wrong? Is there an objective right and wrong, and who gets to determine that? <laughs> and let me give you some of the places. Like, it can be God. God can be the place, that your source for truth. It can be you. Uh, it could be the mainstream culture. Uh, it could be Hollywood. It can be the Twitter, Twitterverse, or God help us, it can be kind of all of that mashed together. Um, and so, um, so let, me, let me ask, I'm going to ask one question and a follow-up question. Don't answer the follow-up question. We good? All right, here's the question. How many in here believe that the Bible is the, is the absolute word of the living God? I see a show of hands. Okay, now put your hands down. How many have read that book from cover to cover? I ask you not to raise hands. <laughs> um, do, you, do you see like, like some of us is like, hey, I, and I believe you believe that, but there is something off if we believe this is God's truth, his living word that's going to lead me on the path to life, but I don't know it. Um, see, there's something wrong. Have you guys ever got those iPhone updates? Right, we get the idea, and then we got to agree, and there's, there's like pages and pages of terms of the agreement. And um, uh, can, I, can I, just for a show, now you can show me this. Has anyone read that? That's a unanimous no. <laughs> Except, <laughs> right? And we accept the terms of it, which we have no idea to do. And so, um, I'm going to read this to you. Um, I, I wrote this out, but I, I wanted to read it because I didn't. Uh, I think it's important. Satan doesn't need something to be true to be powerful. He just needs it to be believed. I'm going to say that one more time. Satan doesn't need something to be true to be powerful. He just needs it to be believed. And so lies 
become the stronghold of Satan, demons, the enemy. It becomes the place where they reside and then they can go out and, and do work, uh, and do, wreak havoc in your life. Strongholds are the place where the lies reside, all right? Um, and so um, let, me, let me give you this. So, so Hosea 4, 6 says this, my people are destroyed because they have a lack of knowledge. In other words, we don't have a standard of God's truth, what he says, and so now suddenly uh, lies from, from the devil, from the enemy, from this, this world, whatever you want to call it, uh, it can seep in because we don't know what actual truth is. Uh, and here's another one. Like, like sometimes we, we, okay, yeah, pastor, the Bible was good for back then, but now we've evolved. Now, now we've got it figured out. Now, in essence, we're smarter than God. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I, I read about this this week. I thought it was so hilarious. Uh, how many have heard of a guy by the name of Voltaire? He was a, a French philosopher back in the 1700s. Uh, he, was a, he was an atheist. He was an antagonist, if you were a Christian. And so uh, Voltaire, uh, he said this. I'm going to paraphrase. But he said this. Uh, in, a, about, in about 100 years from now, he's saying this in 1776, he says, uh, about 100 years from now, the Bible is going to be so antiquated and so outdated that it, you'll just have to go see it in a museum or someone who happens to be curious. Um, but can I just tell you something? 50 years after the death of that guy, Voltaire, you know what happened? Uh, a, a Christian Bible society bought his home and began to distribute Bibles out <laughs> from his home, all right? Uh, and so, um, and so uh, I just thought that was so great. So let me give you uh, another one here is, um, see, like I said, if, if you can buy a lie, then suddenly all this stuff, like our life starts to come unraveled and it turns into madness. And I want to give you an, a few objective, if you can look at some stuff going on today. Uh, let me give you one. Is, how many know this, that today is the International Day of the Woman? Come on, men. Men? Come on. We should, man. Women are awesome. I have a house full of them, all right? Um, and listen, I'm, I'm a hashtag girl dad. I got all girls. I think it's amazing. I love it. I celebrate it. Uh, I want to juxtaposition something, though. Is, um, so there was uh, for, there's two women's groups. One was a uh, right to choose, and one was a, 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 a how do I want to say it? Uh, what is it? Right to life. That's what it is. And right to choose. And, and so they actually interviewed uh, the women in there. And so for, for the, the, the right to choose, they interviewed each woman. And it, 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 was, it was very subjective, just kind of here, here, here. And then, I mean, objective. And so they go, and, and here's what they said. Can anyone be a woman? And the response was unanimously, yes. And then they did the uh, right to life, and they interviewed all the women, and they said, can anyone be a woman? And the answer was, no, of course not. Uh, and so uh, can, let, me, let me give you uh, another one. See, that, like, there's a, there's a small little lie there, and then it starts, it starts weeding off into, into madness. Like, there is objective truth, you know? And so I got news for you. Not anyone can be a, a woman. Uh, let me give you another one. Um, is this, um, can... Uh, so in California, they, they passed a law. And uh, so here's what it is. Uh, every corporate board has to have one woman, at least, on the board. Because here's what they said. Women bring something unique to the business world. And, and listen, I agree. Um, but then they're asking the same group, do you believe that a woman needs to be present in a marriage because she brings something, and the answer was no. And so do you see the hypocrisy and the absurdity of, of the, like our day and age is because we bit into something, and now it's starting to spiral off rather than saying the rock-solid truth of the word of God, like God says, no, I'm truth. I declare this is a marriage. I declare uh, you're a male or a female, all these different things. And yet, you know, and so please hear my heart. I know I'm like uh, going to get like a lot of emails and stuff over this. Uh, but, but hear my heart. Like I, I'm saying this as, as affectionately as I can in love. Um, and so my question is, where do you go for truth? Do you go to the word of God? It is the belt of truth. These next will be much less painful. All right. 
uh, the breastplate of righteousness we put on. And so um, can I tell you what my week has looked like? I've just sensed that there's some things going on amongst our people. I've gotten phone calls. See, uh, uh, pastors and, and like paramedics in law enforcement, they get to see all and hear about all the tragedies that are going on. And so it was just kind of bombarding. And I just felt compelled. I need to intercede for my church and for my people. And I was just pacing in my, in my, my office. And I'm, I'm crying out. And I begin to put on the full armor of God. And I'm like, Lord, I'm going to do battle right now in the name of Jesus, and I'm putting on the belt of truth. And, oh, God, I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness this morning. And as I began to put it on, and I'm, I'm embarrassed of this, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. I put on the breastplate, and I just began to violently cry. And, I, I, and then I would, I would give it some time to try and recover. And then I'd be like, hey, Laura, and I just couldn't stop, get it out of the ditch. And uh, my first thought was, I've been hanging around with Dottie too long. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I was overcome with the reality is, see, we are given a breastplate of righteousness by God. And I'm aware of, I'm not a righteous person. Neither are you. But guess what? But we, we have righteousness. It's a righteousness not of our own. It's one that we get to put on because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so um, uh, here's, here's the weight of everything, was I sense the shame that we can feel in battle, and the idea of shame is to create distance between you and the Savior, and you can no longer be in Him when you're experiencing shame in your life. And so what we need to do is understand, I put on a breastplate of righteousness. No, it's not my own, but it's been given to me by Jesus Christ, how great is he, how loving is he, that he would want to protect my heart from the weight of sin and shame. And so, uh, do you know that the word devil, you know it means accuser. That's the meaning. And so he's going to accuse um, uh, you to God and God to you. Why would God let you, why would God allow that to happen in your life? Well, how, he's not loving, he's not, right? And then he's going to accuse you. God would never receive you. You know what you did. You know what, he's the accuser, and so you need to shut his mouth. I'm going to share uh, uh, this story. It's, a, it's in a book by, uh, by Mark Driscoll. It's called Death by Love. It's a story of, you know, all the stories about the cross. And he tells the story of a husband and wife, and um, they, uh, they're experiencing friction in their marriage, distance. And, um, and they couldn't figure out what was going on because they loved each other, but yet he, she was drifting from him, and he didn't know why and, until finally she got the courage to share with him what had happened in her past. She, she, she shared that she was sexually molested as a child, that, that, that it, it spiraled into promiscuity in her college years, and that when they were engaged in college, that she slept with another man. And she'd been carrying that weight the whole time, and it was created shame and distance. And when that guy heard that, he was devastated. It was a punch in the soul, and he, and the, and he left. And she's like, is he going to come back? Is he going to, what's happening? And then hours later, he came back, and he had a, a bag with him, and he brought it. And he sat with her, and he says, uh, and he pulls out a pristine white negligee, a nightgown. And he says, I want you to put this on. He says, because this is how Jesus sees you, and this is how I choose to see you. See, it's a, it's a righteousness gift from God that he, we put on. Here's another one. Uh, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, I got news for you. Do you know that Roman soldiers, that their, their shoes, they, they would have spikes in the bottom of them, so they would dig in so they could not be moved. So they would, they would stand, and they would stand again against the enemy. And do you notice when they do the armor, armor of God, it's always a frontal armor? It's never a rear armor. You know why? Because the posture of the follower in Christ is never retreat. We are a standing people. We stand, and we stand again. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. And so we stand. We are an advancing people. The kingdom of God will bust down the gates of hell. It's who we are. It's our heritage. So I was reading the book, uh, 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 Make Your Bed. It's, it's by uh, Admiral Willi uh, William McRaven, and uh, he's a Navy SEAL. 
And uh, he tells this story uh, in, in Bud's training when they have to, they have to do a midnight swim uh, off the California coast. Did I mention that it's shark-infested California coast? No thank you. I would ring the bell. Can't be a seal. Um, so they do a, a night swim in the dark. And here's what they tell their men. Uh, if you're confronted by a shark, you are not to turn and swim the other way. You confront the shark. He says, and you, you, you never turn your back on him. And you keep him in front of you. And if he charges at you, you're to punch that shark right in its beak, right in its nose. He says, because when you're confronted by a bully, he says, you confront the bully. You stand. And if he comes to you, you hit him in the face. And, and that's what we do. The devil is a bully. And we need to stand. And it says, we stand, we resist the devil. And the Bible says very clear, he's going to run from you. All right? And so I want to encourage us in that. Um, uh, here's a, uh, a quote. If you don't kneel before God, you'll never stand against the devil. And so we want to be a kneeling people that we can stand against the devil. Uh, I'm going to fly through these. The shield of faith. Can I just simplify this? The shield of faith. You've got to answer this question this morning. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe God or are you going to believe something else? There's only two choices. And so uh, that's all faith is. Is I ch you you choose to believe in God? It's it's the first question uh, in the you know in the book of Genesis. You got you got a choice between these two tre trees or two people. You're gonna believe the opinion of Satan or believe Jesus. And so that's where we're at. Uh, here's uh, number five. Or is this uh, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit? Uh, so men, this is uh, it's International Women's Day, but I want to talk to the men for a minute. Uh, uh, so I, I should pick on somebody. Um, uh, the Trinity of Guy movies. Shout them out, man. Braveheart. Braveheart. Gladiator. Die Hard. Die hard. <laughs> Come on, one more. Men? Godfather 2, Lord. See, we, women, you're right. We do have much work to do amongst our men. <laughs> it's Gladiator 100, all right? <laughs> It's okay, but, but we will get those. But um, my, my wife knows, and, and actually once a year I have to use this illustration, and so my, 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 one of my all-time favorites is Braveheart, right? William Wallace, and, and I'll tr try and watch that every now and then, and then I'll, I'll chase my wife around the house, and I go, I love you, I've always loved you, <laughs> right? And that'll be my, my Wallace in, impersonation for her. And, uh, but there's this great scene when William Wallace... His uncle comes riding in, and, and young Wallace, as a, as a boy, uh, his, his uncle gets down, and he sees this enormous sword that his uncle has. And as any little boy, you could see his eyes light up like, whoa. And so uh, his, his uncle sees him, and he, and he says this quote. He says, he says, first, I need to teach you to use this. Then I'll teach you to use this. And you know, the sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation they work the same way, that, that we renew our mind with the word of God, that the word drops down into our heart, and then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so that's how the sword of the spirit and the hell. So we want to fill our mind with thoughts of God, renew our mind to the word of God. Some of you, you think you're a victim to thoughts that come in. I, I'll, I'll just appeal to you like Martin Luther did. He said this, he says, I can't stop birds from flying over my head. He says, but I can keep them from nesting in there. And so that's all we got to do, gang, is, is we begin to renew our mind to the word. We cast down thoughts that don't align with God's word, and we bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then you know what you do? You start praying, speaking, confessing the word of God, um, because God wants us to be an advancing people.